Hey, everybody, and welcome to Classical Stuff That You Should Know. This is AJ Hannenberg, and I am joined by two of my colleagues, Graham Donaldson. Hi. Who is there, <laughs> wow. even if he doesn't want to answer. I didn't realize And it. Thomas Magby. Hi. Okay, I'm, I'm, no, I'm just not going to say your names anymore. <laughs> Our podcast is all about teaching you about old things. And, ooh, I bonked my mic there. Sorry about that. Uh, teaching about old stuff, old books, old paintings, old things. Uh, I think I got another old painting cooking up in the works oh, for the next few months. Oh yeah, it's gonna be awesome. I think. Good for you. Uh, I don't. I don't know if you it'll make spoil, for a good episode. You want to spoil what the painting uh, is? I'm thinking about doing the. What is it? It's called Dutch Proverbs by Peter Bruegel's The Elder. Uh, you said that you might do a Bruegel's episode. I guess. I, yeah. I, I thought you meant just like biography, but specifically about a little about... bit of both. So okay, I'll tell cool. you about Bruegel's and his kid, and then hmm. the cool painting that they did. Anyway, that's coming up in the future. But today is not my day. Today is yeah, Graham Donaldson's say, day. Whose day is this? Talking about <laughs> this is Graham Donaldson's episode. day. He gets to talk about whatever he wants, and we will. We are so proud of him yeah, for it. Thank you. Like we just wow. Well, today we're going to be talking about a painting by Bruegel's the Elder. No, <laughs> <laughs> Look at you go, Graham. I'm waiting for that one of these days. Uh, one, someone actually someone is stealing steal a topic. topic. Yeah. We have we ever gotten together where i was like i'm gonna do this and everyone's like uh i'm also i think we may have i think i think you and i have once or twice um this one i don't uh, uh this is this is part four i believe so uh listener you've heard us talk about um the spring of rome the winter of rome <laughs> and the summer of rome and so we're here to round out our four parts autumn series. the fall of rome yes, thank you good um no this uh, so i yeah maybe saying that because that before the episode started i handed out a poem called the fall of rome by wh outen for my illustrious colleagues here we'll read it in a second <laughs> you also gave one to me so thank you Another, yeah, let, <laughs> and you. also maybe Thanks. um but I, what got me thinking about this topic was the idea of the muses. So the muses in history, the muses in poetry, were this outside divine being. Well, actually, maybe AJ, you can tell us what the muses were because you, you goddesses of inspiration. So Homer the, invokes them prior to the Iliad and the Odyssey. The muses speak through you as you good. undertake artistic endeavors. So you and the muses kind of enter into this relationship and the muses speak through you and you are putting words into the world that have been inspired and guided by the muses. So Homer does this. Uh, Virgil does this. Um, does Dante invoke the muses at all? The, does he invoke... In, purgatory for sure he talks about the muses mm-hmm. we got to that at the very end i don't remember at the beginning of inferno i think it's less the. i think he does invoke the muse but i think it might be i'm gonna check you yeah. know what yeah. i we, have we a have copy of it. Yeah, milton sure. milton doesn't invoke the muses he does but then he also invokes the holy spirit as the higher muse interesting um and so my point being that in the ancient world there was this idea that poetic inspiration came from outside of yourself and flowed through you and you presented to the world some sort of artifact in this sense of poem um, that came through you but wasn't wholly from you that you were a vessel for speaking this true and beautiful thing into the world this was the classical understanding of the poetics or at least part of what was happening in the poetics is it in dante this is line seven of the second canto because the Mm -hmm. first canto serves as an introduction to the entire divine comedy this is him invoking the muses for just Mm. the inferno O muses, O high genius, help me now. O memory that wrote down what I saw, here your true excellence shall be revealed. Yeah, and then that idea, so even in the the classical world, the idea of genius was an outside thing that humans participated in. And humans were either chosen by the muses or by genius, and you ended up becoming these vessels. Okay, that's that's the classical understanding of what's happening in poetry. Um, And then... As more modern people, the more romantic idea of what's happening in poetry is that genius has is not without. Genius is not on the outside that you are partaking in. Genius is something that is emanating from inside an individual, and the individual is expressing his or her genius out through their poetry. Very, very different things, um, and come from very different understandings, not only of art, of the individual, and of truth in that matter as well. This might come Mm -hmm. up later, but what would you then say? So Homer, Mm -hmm. the muses are working through him to produce Iliad and the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. But what would you, how would you describe Homer then? Is he more in touch with some sort of like spiritual realm where like something he's, he's closer to that and able to speak it? You would you not attribute to him some type of intelligence to say he produced this work? You do lucky. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. That's what it is at that point. Um, It is. Um, 
but um, so the fact that we don't that the fact that the ancient world is not obsessed with biographies, <laughs> sure. I think is also kind of part of this. That's interesting. To the point where even in the Middle Ages, we don't even know a lot of the artists who made cathedrals and, and wrote wrote things. We right. don't know who wrote Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. We don't know. It's not, it's, we don't know. Right. The, the, it's not by so-and-so. So, um, and I think that has something to do with it, is that, um, Yes. The, so the modern historian will look back and say there is something genius about Homer that this could come from an individual ma- man's thought and brain and heart that to produce such a thing. But in the ancient world, they weren't saying that. The ancient world were saying that the marriage of the individual and maybe his individual powers, as well as him being in touch with or chosen by the genius of the world, of the universe, together has created this vision, has created this thing. Uh, we just don't think that way anymore. But in the, the, the ancient world, poetry was almost like um, the poet was the sort of like the vessel or the conduit yes. of this great truth. So um, now poetry isn't one of the seven liberal arts. Um, but uh, I was reminded by this. I was listening to a podcast by Andrew Kern. And those of you who really like classical education really should go listen to the Ask Andrew, Ask Andrew. It's great. podcast. It yes. is fascinating and very good. And um, if you're looking for practical application or staying on topic, stay here. Yeah, stay, stay right where you are. Not even yeah, here. Exactly, I mean, just yeah. yes. <laughs> it's, probably, it's not for you. <laughs> Andrew just Kern look, is not a man of, uh, who is going to give you practical tidbits of how to no, do stuff. Kind of, but to his credit, he's been. Uh, he is now like forced to a timeline. So he, uh, if you've been re- listening to recent episodes, it's, it is his he daughter has, haranguing he, him yes, to exactly. stay in it's 15 very funny. minutes and well, it's an hour start, long. He'll start with a 15 minute and then go to a five and then a, and a bunch of one minute questions. It's very funny. It is very funny, yeah, but he's kept to a, a, a short time, t- time that, frame. Yeah. The reason he doesn't get to practicals is because he is concerned with the theory behind things and rightfully so, mm-hmm. right? If you ask like, how do I build a test? He says, well, are tests the right thing for yeah, things exactly. for your kids, right? Exactly. He's, he's on the Socrates level. We're mm-hmm. all down in it's the true. yes man level. The colonel is a genius. And he would also reject the... Oh, I shouldn't have even said that. That's even against... Because he's not a genius. The colonel is a vessel <laughs> of genius. The music speaks through um, him. But he, and he would reject the distinction between practical and theoretical, he which would. is also charming. And so I don't anyway. think he's aware that we call him the colonel. That's fine. Did you all come It'll up with this? It'll pick up. Me and, me and Hanberg have been calling him the colonel for years. Call His last name's Kern. So, uh, that, that's the entire story. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. Kern... The Colonel, if you're listening, we love you, and we attend every talk we can possibly get of you. Sure. So yes. mm-hmm. even we're, with yeah, SEL being online, I yeah, watched. Totally. I think there are two from Andrew Kern. So it's yeah. not a criticism. We go and we just listen to your theory. Yes. And it's great. Anyway, um, but he's got this great thing where he's talked about that the seven liberal arts are creating harmonies, and and by harmonies he means they are also revealing a different aspect of truth. And so, just very briefly. Um, grammar is revealing the harmony of giving names to things or giving words having definitions. Logic is creating the harmony of your thoughts so that they can coherently live together, that you're not illogical, that they can flow. Uh, Rhetoric is, he says that rhetoric brings harmony to community, which I think is really interesting. Um, Arithmetic brings harmony to um, um, quantities, Um, Music brings, and that's what's closer to poetry, music brings harmony to sound. Um, Astronomy brings harmony to the heavens and the cosmos and and sort of the spiritual realm. And geometry brings harmony to space, uh, to, um, to shape. Did you say arithmetic is the one that's closest to poetry? No, music. Sorry. It, it's, okay. So music is like the, uh, sorry, uh, poetry is a mixture of, I would say, like sort of music and language or right. music and grammar, music and definitions. But all of those seven liberal arts in their creating their harmonies are causing the individual to understand or perceive truth through different ways. Yeah. And um, so poetry, uh, as classically understood, is uh, C.S. Lewis says um, you should think uh, classically understood that the poet is poems should be seen more as a vision as opposed to either a lesson or um, a picture that they are presenting a vision of something that is true and by sort of living with the poem or having the poem live with live with you you um, um, can perceive truth in a different way than if you studied it or dissected it or took a picture of it or that kind of thing. Uh, Hannenberg, who's that favorite poet of yours that talks about you shouldn't tie poems to a chair and hit him with a belt? Uh, I believe that's Billy Collins. Yeah. And what's his point with that poem? His, 
his students are always trying to solve the poem. They, mm-hmm. they want to like get the answer out of yes. it. And he's like, that's, you don't tie it to a chair and beat it with a hose. I want you to wander around the room looking for a light switch. I want you to explore and feel the poem, not solve it like a math problem. Yeah. And so, um, there's a, the Billy Collins, like collected works is incredible. And even each of those poems, they're more like a single image. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, there's a consistency with that quote with the work that's actually being produced as well. So I'm going to present a metaphor, I think that can help us understand the relationship between the poet and truth and the vision of poetry. So the student in, in, in that is, so we talk about getting to the, the nut or the kernel of truth. Um, where you have a nut and you crack it open and you get the little thing on the inside and you discard the shell. And again, I'm stealing this analogy from Andrew Kern, which was a very helpful one. And that's one way to understand true things. So if you're trying to get to the truth of a matter, you can crack it open and get that little kernel of truth and there you go. But that's not what an acorn is for. What's an acorn for? Growing up. Yeah. Tree. You plant it. So the other way to understand what the poem, what the kernel of truth is mm-hmm. for, but uh, the, is that you take that acorn and you plant it in the ground and you wait a long time and you have a tree and that's the truth sure. of the acorn. So there, uh, and I, I'm guilty of this when it comes to poetry. That I'm, not, I'm um, the convicting part of this was that. Uh, sometimes when I when I talk about poetry, I say that it is this hard thing, and we need to have some little uh, some little break on its shell to crack it open and understand the poem from the inside. Yes, I still hold to that metaphor, and you've probably heard that a lot on this podcast when I talk about poetry. But there is something to the fact that you only can understand the truth. No, there is a kind of truth to, of understanding a poem by having it with you for years and rereading it and having it grow in your heart like an acorn growing into a tree. Wow. So Mm. it's not that you just read the poem and it's one and done, or you take one course on W.H. Auden, you read all of his poems and be like, all right, I I understand Auden. Yeah. But that you have a poem that you go back and you go back and you go back to, and it kind of grows in you like this tree, and this vision fills up your interior space. Everything you're saying makes it sound like it would be very hard to teach poetry because if you're devoting, you know, if in one class you cover two or three poems, Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's far too little time to actually get to anything that you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, uh, what you would be doing in a class is hopefully you're just planting the acorns. And then the hope is that the student over time, that these things grow inside them, which is why, Part of which is why memorizing poetry is a core part of classical education, because by memorizing it and the student having internalized it, hopefully it can pop back into their minds or it's living in them without them even realizing it. Yeah. Didn't you mention during my last podcast, there was a line from a poem you remembered and this. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And this sort of thing happens to me, too, where I'll, I'll be dealing with an issue and a line from a poem will sort of mm-hmm. pop up. There's one that always sticks with me. It's something like newness masquerading it masquerading as if it meant something mm. and it's a it's a criticism of everybody thinking just because it's new it's nice and he like that always pops up to me whenever someone's like new and improved right <laughs> mm-hmm. i remember the first poem that i had to memorize for school this will show you the difference between classical and public education are you prepared for this yeah books to the ceiling books to the sky my pile of books is a mile high oh how i need them i'll have a long beard by the time i read them there you go now, okay that is that profound that's not very profound the uh the that book, takes up space. The poem in my mind. I had to memorize in elementary school was "Nature's First Green Is Gold, Its Hue Is Hard to Hold" um, by Frost. Mm-hmm. And See, then, I would rather have that in anyway. my mind than the books to the ceiling. <laughs> um, okay, so but when you so then what makes a poem worth living in your heart? So this is why this, this idea of the muses inspiring you that a good poem is a poem that says something true. And I know, Hannenberg, this is, we can get into a tussle with this because we can talk about Dorian Gray's intro essay. Uh, I had this kicking around in my mind um, that poetry or that art is useless. All art is useless. Um, but I think um, if you take this idea that a poem, a good poem is a vision of a true thing in the world or a true thing in the cosmos, and the poet expresses that because he is inspired by the cosmos, 
Um, and if you even wanted to baptize that view or Christianize that view, that the poet is partaking, this is what Milton's doing, that the poet is partaking with Christ or with God's spirit to produce a vision of truth, not that is perceived through maybe didactic logic, but through living with the true thing in your in your soul. Yeah. Um, you, you might even call it intellectus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ratio. Exactly. <laughs> intellectus ratio. Now, this sounds totally like crazy woo. Call back. Call back to the call back <laughs> original to an old nine episode. episodes. Yeah, seriously. But this sounds like crazy like woo woo stuff. That um, that the that not only is the poet sort of like getting and plugging himself into the vastness of the universe and then is and then the universe is also expressing itself through the individual poet as, as sort of this vessel and producing this vision. Like that sounds like crazy talk. Because when we think of poets, we think of somebody who is a little well, when we talk about poets, we talk about individual genius. Yes. Here is somebody showing us their point of view in the world. Yes. Um and um and and Therefore, the individual themselves is, is very important, and who they are in their biography and what they've experienced is important. Um, I've never read this, but there is a very interesting debate on this very topic between C.S. Lewis and a contemporary man whose name I can never remember. Um, the, it's either a debate or it's a series of letters, letters back and forth, and it's called The Personal Heresy. I've never read it. In fact, I didn't even know about it until a couple days ago. Um, but I, I read sort of a synopsis. I, I've never read it. So is this, um, is this the one where chronological snobbery comes from? It may be. Okay. Um, but in it, the one guy is saying, no, poetry is only an expression of the individual poet. Oh. And C.S. Lewis says, no, poetry is an expression of an objective truth. Okay. And he And Lewis doesn't mean like, um, well, Lewis is meaning this in this classical sense, that the poet is in touch with the, with the vastness of, of the cosmos and is presenting a vision of that. And this other guy is saying, um, um, no, all it is is just an expression of an individual's point of view. Well, Lewis has always been a fan of he has. poetry yeah. and classicism as reinforcing stable sentiments. Like yes, that's the point exactly. of Milton. That's the point mm-hmm. of poetry is to establish a sentiment in a person that is a right view of the world. I think a lot of his contemporaries disagreed with yes. him, and certainly a lot of moderns would. So yep. this guy disagrees with Lewis by saying, how dare you say that someone writes a poem and you're saying, well, what it's actually about is X. And Lewis retorts and says, well, um, the only way that you can understand poetry is but you were making wild assumptions about the biography of a person. Hmm. And if you take that too far, you are eventually just going to, poetry is going to be this sort of almost like, cult of personality worship where you worship the biography you worship the experience of somebody only so that you can understand their poems and they kind of have this this back and forth tussle i don't really know where i fall in it i mean obviously is, my sympathies are more on the classical that, side which is kind of fun because then from that i mean if we, we play that out just like we were in the last episode we were playing some things out if you play out that attitude that is where you get the like hopeless romantic poet sure. that i need to live a certain life of poverty and yeah. like on the fringes and feeling feelings really extremely to be able to write good poetry is because it must come from a life lived notably as opposed to a Chaucer as opposed right. to a Chaucer who or a was like a or tax a collector yeah. or a Shakespeare who ran a company yeah. or you know somebody who does just a regular old job right. and does and also produces incredible art right we we feel like if it's an expression of a biographical notability that yes. it has to be this crazy thing. Yeah, the romantic poet needs to be somebody who lives life of an extremity so that they can say something new, whereas the classical poet needs to live a life of the common man so that he can say something that true about the like that the that he can be a vessel for the the basically the the commonality of the universe. It's the old true versus new diality. Yeah, tr- Duality? Yeah. True versus new. What do you call it? Uh, diality? diality? That's not a word. <laughs> mm. I get but yeah wouldn't you still expect poetry to come from a certain type of person? I don't know. Don't, I don't, uh, having many life experiences, doesn't that make you more likely to have something profound to say? I think uh, we've talked about this before, but I think if wisdom is a true view of the world, right, mm-hmm. you are closer to viewing the world accurately Then I would say, you don't have to have like more life experience. You have to have a correct view of the experiences you've had. Yeah. And that's why one of our best poets, Seamus Haney, 
was also a translator and a i think he was a professor and yeah. like he translated beowulf he wasn't as far as i know he wasn't living on the fringes i probably shouldn't say that without knowing more about his life but but that's yeah that's fair for like uh, lewis or tolkien also right uh, but they, they worked at as like chairs of education yeah it wasn't Tol- tolkien lived like within 10 or 10 miles of where he was born yeah, something crazy exactly. like that i guess he went to war at one point and then came back but there wasn't a crazy life experience he got that through translating norse works right that's yeah. where yeah and lewis had didn't have a wife until he was well established as an sure. author and yep. so he he wasn't having like these crazy romances as far as i know right and yeah and you so if you feel that the only way to to say something true is to say is to be novel yes well then you are eventually going to be pushing yourselves into the into place probably places you don't want to be um uh, or or experiences you don't want to have um or you say that horrible thing well well everything is just sort of fodder for the The story for the story and it doesn't matter and you know so if i have to live a life of pain. And, uh, if I seek out a life of terrible things, well, then I can sort of use that torturedness to express my art. It's like that can't be. That's not. That's not. What you, how you want to live? But why I mean, is that? A, why is that a popular notion? Why do people think that that art requires suffering? Um, because we, I think, we see it as this sort of this romantic um, mentality that that's the only way that that's the only way that genius can come from that genius yeah. has to come from some sort of like tortured individual. And we sort of port that view into history. And we're like, Oh, Beethoven must mm. have been absolutely tortured that he was going deaf or Shakespeare must, he had to have had something. Right. What could it have been? Maybe it was like the death of his child. And it's like, well, I mean, you, this is the, the obsession we have with biography that we feel like we have to explain good we have to explain the, the the true good poem because somebody has had some kind of profound life when you don't need to have the profound life. I think I think there's a few things going on here. Nobody wants to hear that the real answer on why it's a good poem is hard work. Yeah, and education. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like no one wants to no one wants to find out that if they're going to be a famous poet, what they have to do is study poetry for ten right. years, teach English for another ten, and then like practice. No yeah. one, yeah, the form. No one, yes. no one wants to Perfect. learn that you need to practice a form. And the other reason is because I think uh, I think this is reflected in music to to do something new and novel, which is often what gathers fame. Your poetry is different from everybody else's poetry. Often those people did live weird lives, right? They are out on the fringes. They have some sort of mental thing happening. And like that certainly happens in music. Yeah. Sometimes drugs fuel a new different sound. Mm-hmm. But those those are, I don't know, transient and transi- transitory, mm-hmm. I guess. They they don't always stick around. But because, because we are aiming for novelness rather than truth... Mm-hmm. That no- novelness, a new word, will you will sometimes come from somebody that's lived a strange life, right? Saying true things is very rarely saying new things. Hmm. Um, but this is even f- hard, further than that. Or the, the classical understanding of of the muses and poetry pushes that even further, saying that um, it's almost that the individual doesn't matter. Um, now. Um, because it's the thing that they are saying. So, um, can we only understand Paradise Lost? Do we have to go read a giant biography of Milton in order to do it? Um, classically, you would say no, but as modern people, we would say, how can you even start to understand a work until you can understand the person's history? Do you not, is there not a deeper understanding of a work to be gained from a person's biography? So, I'm, you're trying to separate the work I think from that's, the person. I don't think that's fair. Okay. Um, I think that's, I think if you say that, um, that you uh, say this must be why Megby wrote this poem because Megby had this experience in his life and therefore I'm going to sort of spin out why Megby did this is, un- it, is an unfair thing to say. You think it undermines the work. Correct. So no longer is it about Milton genuinely just wanted to portray creation and Adam and Eve. It's he had a complex from the way his dad exactly. mistreated him or whatever. I right? think in that sense that... Um, trying to to give some sort of causal relationship needs to happen if you want to analyze a poem romantically emanating from somebody's genius or from uh, it. In in essence, you are treating the the person like some sort of specimen, whereas classically, it's like. Um, I think also classically, they believe that all men were capable of this because all men experienced um, the world. And only, and then the muses 
inspired some and not others. Whereas we say, yeah. oh man, like there's only one Kanye and only only he could have done what Kanye does. Sure. Um, um, or even your... And it's his bipolar disorder and, that lets him do it. And it's his bipolar yeah. disorder that lets him do it I, and all this sort of thing. And the classical man would say that... Um, insofar as Kanye is saying true things, it is because the muses have inspired him and he is getting in touch with, um, the universality of human experience. I think there's, I'm going to do that thing that I always do, which is bring it back to worldview. Um, as, as we move into the modern times, if there is no central meaning and man defines meaning, then if you are to understand the meaning found in a poem, you have to understand the man because he is creating the meaning, which is not the ancient view, which was there is a singular truth that Mm -hmm. we can know or not know. And so I don't have to know you and your background to understand if you've hit the nail on the head or not. Mm -hmm. I can read your poem and understand it just fine compared to what I already know about the world. Mm -hmm. But if we each create our own meaning, how can I even come close to understanding your poem until I've understand the way that you would create meaning? Mm -hmm. Right. I think, I think that's another piece of the puzzle is it's just a, a shift in where we think meaning comes from. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to interpretation of a poem, there's a couple of layers. So, um, you got your crumb <laughs> he, and you and got you your, you got <laughs> your sponge. You got your uh-huh. fruit. Yeah. You got your fruit. Yeah. Uh-huh. But, and you're going to need to be dispersed in the sponge All yeah. throughout. and then right. you need the, the frosting on, on top. And then great, the yeah. graham cracker crust mm, right on top. Yeah. Um, Perfect. <laughs> uh, so, um, because if you, instead of a, a poem is not just trying to communicate an idea, but it is trying to express a vision it is perfectly fine for somebody to have a subjective experiences of a poem. So, for example, I'm just going to read The Fall of Rome. Okay. And the last stanza is the one that I think about a lot because I'm from a place where this is true. Now, I'll, I'll get you the last stanza. Okay. So, this is called The Fall of Rome by W.H. Auden, and it's talking about um, sort of the slow decay of a civilization. So, fall of Rome. I'm going to read it. The piers are pummeled by the waves. In a lonely field, the rain lashes an abandoned train. Outlaws fill the mountain caves. Fantastic grow the evening gowns. Agents of the Fisk pursue, absconding tax defaulters through the sewers of provincial towns. Private rites of magic send the temple prostitutes to sleep. All the literati keep an imaginary friend. Cerebratonic Cato may extol the ancient disciplines, but the muscle-bound marines mutiny for food and pay. Caesar's double bed is warm, as an unimportant clerk writes, I do not like my work on a pink official form. Unendowed with wealth or pity, little birds with scarlet legs, sitting on their speckled eggs, I each flew infected city. Altogether, elsewhere, vast herds of reindeer move across miles and miles of golden moss, silently and very fast. Um, so, uh, just... In terms of a personal relationship with a poem, we can talk about what the poem is about. We can talk about the imagery that the poem uses. But uh, in terms of uh, but talking about how a poem uh, plants in your soul like a, an acorn and grows, um, by as somebody who is from a place where there may not be reindeer, but has come from a vast place where herds of animals move, there was something very personal to me about that last stanza um, saying that completely far away from civilization, there exists a place where nature continues on unthinking about the world. And um, so as somebody who has moved from a very remote place to the, to the United States, which is kind of the center of, of the Western world, in many ways, the center of the world, uh, this may upset people, but as a Canadian, that's, uh, I felt that. By moving to a place that is where all the action of the world is happening from a place where none of the action of the world is happening, that last stanza has a, um, a very subjective truth to me, if I want to put it that way. Has, like, that has resonated with me in, in a way. But I can't stand up. I, you would never write a book or teach a class or talk about the meaning of the poem, and I would sort of say, and I would sort of 
talk about that last stanza in that way because that has nothing to do with anybody else. That is just my own relationship with the poem. If the tree is growing in my soul, those are branches for me alone, right? Um, because that's just been my experience of it. Um, so, um, uh, um, that, um, because the poem is, so if you, if you view a poem as a vision through a poet who is being inspired by the muses in touch with sort of the universal, then that fears, feels like a very, um, natural thing to do that this poem was written for the everyman. But if you have the view that the poem emanates from the particular genius uh, from from an individual's um, experience, then in many ways, um, having your own subjective relationship with a poem kind of feels like you're invading, or that you're not supposed to be there because this is his own. This is his own genius, and um, I don't know. It's the difference between like walking through a cathedral and you don't know the name of the person who made it. Yeah. Or being at the concert down in the pit, singing the song of the person on stage, and he's like, "Yes, sing my words." <laughs> you know, that's sure. like a it's a it's a very different vision of of the of the experience of art. One is welcoming, and the other is worshiping, almost. Yeah, in in one you are an acolyte, in the other you are. Ah. Served. Now, let me put it this way. In the first one, the artist and the experiencer are both there to worship God or to worship the thing that um, spoke to the artist. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the other one, when you were in the in, pit in singing... Case, the, yes, muse, the muse. The muse. Case, okay. And in the other one, when you were in the pit of the, of the audience singing the song of the artist on stage, you are as worshiping him or her or whatever. I've always had that gross feeling every time I've gone to a concert because mm. it just sort of feels like that. Whereas um, when the artist is unknown or not present, which is probably why it's easier to do with a painting than it is a performance, mm. um, then you can then you then the art can be the portal to the meaning the, that the, it's pointing to the truth and the meaning that it's pointing to. But don't you worry? more the so in teaching poetry isn't the problem more likely to be a student doing what you're saying finding latching on to one line and kind of deriving a meaning to it that is unrelated to the work itself um y yes right so like if, if so if a student says when i read that line uh the sewers of provincial towns i thought about the sewer that's outside my bedroom uh grading you know outside where all the rainwater flows into mm. And that's what, my, but that's what the poem means. It's like, no, no, that's not what the poem means. Sure. Um, but what's, what that student is doing is he is developing a relationship to the With poem. With poem, yes. Which is, which is good, but, but don't, um, but again, the poem is not there to sort of reinforce, like, in many ways, it's almost like, keep it to yourself. Mm. I'm, which is ironic because I just talked about my relationship with the last stanza. Um, but again, it feels almost embarrassing to say it. It's kind of like the embarrassment you have of talking about the romantic deep joy where it's like, it means something to me, but it doesn't mean anything, something to anybody else. Yeah. Like my deep joy moment was sitting near a lake in Canada. Yeah. Hey, let's, Canada does that to you. I mean, it's pretty, it's beautiful. Yeah. I, I'm just not sure. Yeah. I don't know why embarrassment is the reaction to that because other people don't share in that. Because you seem ridiculous, right? You seem you're, ridiculous, You're like, yeah. I was experiencing this transcendental moment. And they're like, what were you doing? And you're like, sitting near a lake. Yeah. Like, it's, if, not, it's not this amazing moment. if you experience, then probably other people have also, right? There's a commonality to that experience. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, other people have felt deep joy sitting on the side of a lake as well. Or for me, once it was driving my car. Yeah. Sure. Like, just driving around. Um, but if you were teaching the poem, I mean, the poem is about... The fall of Rome. The fall of Rome, sure. and and it's not even the Rome because they're talking about trains. So it's not it's not a historical poem talking about Rome. Right. It's talking about the slow end of a civilization and the the disconnects between the various people. Caesar with his warm double bed and some dude who like has to work this bureaucratic job, yes. um, scribbling "I hate my job." on his on his tax forms or whatever yeah um, and people then the birds trying, looking at flu ridden cities yeah and the, yeah. the birds oh man uh so good for today yeah. um and the uh and 
people are, are are dodging their taxes and and fleeing the the authorities and outlaws are like filling the caves like the caves are filled with outlaws because the law I don't know the laws have become so oppressive or whatever right going back to last podcast um uh, I mean I am I was hard on Mert McMurphy but it's but it's the fact that like um both sides of the of the the social contract aren't keeping up their ends um when one is overtaxing, the other side is going to dodge taxes and yeah, become, a, and become there, criminals. There's an agent of the Fisk pursuing tax absconders. That's right. right through the through the sewers, and I had to look up the Fisk. The Fisk was the like the Roman bank coffers, right? The treasury. Yeah. So agents of the Fisk chasing around Romans underneath the cities. So Rome has to raise taxes because they've mismanaged their money, creating criminals of ever of us right. all. And um, and the trains are being just beaten by rain. They're not in use. They're mm-hmm. they're off. The peers that were supposed to bring train. in uh, the goods uh, from the world are being beaten by the waves and the boats aren't coming in. And then you have literati, the, the, the smart people having imaginary friends and private magics sending prostitutes to sleep. Yep. Like it's, it's not a great you picture. decadence right? uh, of... And then at the end, you have a unity of a group, right? A group all together, a herd moving across miles and miles, silent and fast. Like they are together together doing what they're supposed to be doing. And th- it's this idea that nature apart from the organizing of man continues on. Yeah. Like the birds are sitting there. They don't have wealth. They don't have pity. They just have their eggs and they're looking at a city dying, uh, you know, people together who are dying of disease and the birds can get out of there and far, far away, away from the problems, away from the decaying of this culture. Um, the reindeer are moving through this field as if they've been doing it for 10,000 years. Yeah, it's, and it's beautiful. And it's beautiful. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I, mm-hmm. uh, but, So you're focused on the individual works, if I'm hearing this correctly. So, what do you mean? So like the point here is to let the fall of Rome, the fall of Rome is the acorn in your metaphor from before. Yeah. So it should take root and grow. Good, yes. Well, uh, but I'm, I, I'm probably not taking it the direction you want, so don't say good yet. But you also read other Auden poems, mm-hmm. right? I, again, I'm, I'm wondering, at some point, there is a relationship you develop with the poet himself, the poet himself mm-hmm. but not through biography, yes. right? Yes, through, vo- through, through the voice the, that he has. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so maybe you would say that's a relationship with the muses, in fact, but <laughs> the, the muse the muses give different pieces of truth to different people. Right. So there's still some way to know Auden is different from Plato is different from. Yeah. Pick your yes, person. There are. Yes. The poets to have definitely have different voices. Yes. And for example, so I had the, um, the every man's companion to Auden yes. on my bedside table yeah. and there's 200 poems and I devoured that thing cover to cover, loved it. And I was like, this is great. And I bought the every man's poetry of Robert Frost I can't do it. There's <laughs> and, just and something what's about the, Frost's voice. Yep. And now when, but I've listened to people who are into Frost mm. talk about Frost and I can, and I can say to myself, ah, yes, he does. He is capturing the vision of the universal. He is capturing the vision of the experience of being a person. The muses are talking to him. Right. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, I just don't like I just don't like that express that that version of the yes. muses. Yes, and I think that's fair. Okay. I think people can say, "Well, I just don't like Auden, or I just don't like Frost." But um, uh, right, you might you might think Modest Mouse is saying something great about the universe, but you might like it better said by you too. Yeah, <laughs> but the, <laughs> the but then thing. the controversial point. No, something that the romantic um, interpreter of poetry can never say is Frost or Auden is wrong mm. about the vision. They can I'll never say that. All they can say is that that's just their, that's just, that's just like your opinion, man. Or that's just so, like, so that's it, just your experience. Sure. So it's neither right or wrong. But, it is, and this is the, yeah. this is the controversial thing is that the classical, um, interpreter of poetry or the classical, or someone who can go and have a reading of poetry can read something and say, the vision that this poet has is, incongruous with nature mm. <laughs> capital n wow. nature yeah and i think modern people would say how you can't, can't say, say that, that. Right. and the people medieval are man, nature yes <laughs> and then like but the, the 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 in the old classical world they could say yes totally there could be a milton who posited something and it was actually wrong mm-hmm. and therefore the poetry is not good because it was a a wrong vision mm-hmm. um and uh and i just think that no one believes that today. 
everyone's just sort of uh, stuck in solipsism. Well, that's just his expression, and this is your expression, and and you may like his, and he may like yours, but somebody must like his, and um, and so like, how can you how can you say what is good, and how can you say what is bad? How can you say what is everything beautiful beyond that is opinion? Yeah. yeah, and this is um, and this is kind of what like on purpose ugly modern art is trying to do it's trying to get people to say no this is bad mm. um but no one wants to do it so like someone putting up a urinal as like here's a beautiful a, painting it was golden wasn't it i thought there was something a special, gold, but yeah i don't know whatever um anyway so this is kind of the like i thought it was just a, was it just a, a urinal one? it was yeah, a regular wonderful. urinal and it said like this is art or something mm-hmm. And because he was the first one to do it, it was a big deal. There is. Uh, did you ever watch the the Roger Scruton do, uh, documentary about beauty? Yeah, uh, it's been a while. But yeah. Well, yes. I mean, he died, yes. but um, but he, in, in it, he's talking about that. Um, what is his? Uh, is it like a history of conservatism or something? I, I don't know. I, anyway, I, 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 conservatism and an invitation to the great tradition. I think is the book. Anyway, well, he, he did a BBC documentary on, yeah. on beauty. Yes, and ultimately. If you have the romantic idea of uh, that art is just sort of the expression of the genius of the individual, um, eventually you, you, beauty is going to be sacrificed. Yes. Because beauty is a standard that needs to be hit, according to the classical mind. But the modern mind is that, what, beauty is in the eye of the holder or beauty is some sort of like... It's subjective at the very least. Or yeah. authenticity is beauty. Being, yes. being true to yourself is the beautiful. Yeah. Um, but if you're kind of a dirtbag then being true to that dirtbaggedness is not beauty sure but but who are you to say exactly so? but the modern man can't get out of it it's just your opinion man um, it's just like your opinion man <laughs> um there was uh, a modern person would still disagree with dirtbaggedness right mm-hmm. well um but this is ha uh and this is i think although i've never read it this is what i think c.s lewis's point is In why he calls it the the personal heresy is because the heresy is that the modern man tries to have it both ways. Um, the so modern what? the modern man tries to have a um, a transcendent view that there is a god that we appeal to, but then also a materialist, a materialist view that all of these things are equally important. And you and Lewis is saying you can't have both of those things at the same time. You need to pick one. And if you pick the the view that there is a transcendent um, that there is a transcendent truth then the art needs to be in conversation with that or else it's yes. bad. Right. And if you reject that, then there are no standards through which you can assess anything. And then um, it's all just taste or it's all just like preference, preference yeah. um, or um, uh, or popularity sure. or what gets uh, what gets eyeballs. Um, actually, I was having a conversation with Amanda about this. My wife, we were having a walk and we were talking about um, – um, the, the difference between popularity and and what and sort of what's good, and I um, I remember and we were talking about like Netflix shows and are there any television shows that are going to last over the next fifty years and that kind of thing, and oh yeah she was saying we, she was talking about like um, we were talking about time and how did, should you make time to read hard books, and she was saying like Graham you can carve out three hours on a Sunday to read a book. Um, but you, but we have a certain kind of life that makes that available. Um, can we, should we be expect, should people expect that or should we expect that of everybody else to be able to do that? Um, whereas, and, I, and my retort was, well, people watch entire series of Netflix sure. and, and she said, yeah, but those are easier to absorb. Yes. Um, then I started thinking, I wonder what is the most viewed thing on the internet. And then I realized, oh, I probably know what the most viewed thing on the internet is and it ain't a good thing. Oh, it's something yeah. that is very easy yeah. to absorb sure. yes. in a very base way. I mean, PewDiePie is not that bad. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank <Yes>. you. Wonderful. <laughs> um, and so that I was, you know, uh, and that is, you know, pornography is clearly like a great scourge. Yes. And so, anyway, it's just, um, uh, and so then, how can the romantic? If you have the romantic view of art, how can they explain away the popularity of 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 smut? Um, what do you mean explain a, it away? Well, um, you're saying how can they say that? People shouldn't watch porn. Exactly. And they should yes. How can they say that they should? How can they delineate between something that is clearly so popular and something like um, 
the divine comedy. Sure. What's the, how can you come a difference? Uh, how can you sort of delineate some sort of difference between that? The funny thing is that we do, we have that requirement. There are people who work at Facebook whose job it is to delineate between artistry and smut. Exactly. Yes. Right. If, and then if what's I the have, category if, that they, that they work under? If I have to take down any image of a real human person that is nude, do I also have to take down a nude statue of like Athena, mm-hmm. like which, where, which one crosses the line? And then mm-hmm. what if it's a nude statue of someone who is not Athena and it's a recently made statue? Is mm-hmm. that the same thing? What if it like, they have to have meetings about yeah. this. And so there are people making this decision, yep. but by what, well, what standard, like, right? Well, yeah. How is, what is Facebook's ethos? Exactly. My, my guess is a standard is not, is the artist inspired by, uh, objective beauty and truth. Or not? I think I that think the face. Yeah. I think the Facebookian standard is simply trying to avoid lawsuits. What? Yes. What did you we, listen? There's a reply all. I think it's reply all did an episode on this, and their the trouble Facebook ran into is that in the moment they'd be very clear. This is what we should do. So like violence committed by cartels in Mexico, they allowed that to be on Facebook so people could like raise awareness. But the problem then was when the next violent video got posted that had nothing to do with the pro social cause. What's your reason for taking it down? Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. There was, there wasn't an overarching strategy. It was each individual incident. We have to figure out for itself. Yeah. Well, live, we, we mm-hmm. live in a CYA kind of environment now, sure. which has these other, um, um, sort of interesting social outworkings. Yeah. Um, anyway, but sort of back to the topic at yeah. hand. Um, do we want, I mean, this is, I don't really have much more to say about it. Otherwise, other than well, may, may there, I, like if you were teaching this poem to a student, there is the, what's this poem about? We can talk about what it's about. We can talk about how the images talk about the sort of the slow dissolution of society and how nature continues on, even if Rome isn't into dust. And, this happened when the British Empire is turning into dust. And this will happen when the trains of America or the airplanes of America uh, no longer fly. The reindeer will still um, will still go uh, in the plains of Canada or whatever. That could that's like the crack the nut and get the kernel of truth. Totally fine, and that's probably the that's probably as far as as an academic school can get. Um, well, all you're required to do is plant the seed. Yes. You, right. you can't grow it. I That's can't right. cultivate it over 20 years, but I can certainly plant it. Sure. And then the hope is that, that the poem once planted can grow and that the older you get, um, your relationship with the truth of that poem, insofar as it is inspired by the muses, quote unquote, insofar as it is in conversation with God, um, uh, then the um, the sort of the woo woo spirit uh, part of it is that the st- insofar as that the student continues to have that true thing, that true and beautiful thing grow inside them, um, uh, that it will elevate them. Well, I mean, you you resonated with a certain line, but I can see several others in here that would resonate with students different depending on what sure. dis- discipline they entered. If they ended up being a literati, if they went mm-hmm. to academia. The moment when they see all of their friend, their colleagues who are PhDs extolling these wild, insane ideas mm-hmm. out on the frigid fringes to try to keep popularity, right? That sounds an awful lot like the literati keeping an imaginary mm-hmm. friend. Or down at the bottom, if I went to the military, right? Cato may extol the ancient disciplines. Like mm-hmm. there is an ancient discipline to be had. But if I'm standing there and all of my marine brethren, instead of thinking about discipline and truth and honor and glory are like, look, we're out of here unless you feed us and pay us. If, mm-hmm. if they're all out because they're not being, they're not being taken care of number one and the virtues are not extolled within them. Like you, that should, that should ring an alarm bell for you, mm-hmm. right? If mm-hmm. in the military, even if, even in the military, one, they're not cared for. And two, there's no connection to the virtues. That's dangerous. They've become mercenaries. Mm-hmm. And yep. so if you go into the military, that would that would resound pretty big if all of everyone around you was clamoring for better pay. Yeah. Right. So I can see how this would develop. Or students would have experience with leaders saying one thing but actually doing another. Right. That's the sure. Cato and Marine one there too. And and looking at the difference between the people at the top, the, the double bed is Caesar, warm yeah. and First them the hating worker. their work in the in the as a clerk, right? Mm-hmm. So, so I, I can see that growing. And there are many ways into the poem. That's, yeah. again, that's a thing you've talked about before, Graham. Lots of touch points. Um, I just, I'm trying to, you're, again, maybe you didn't mean for this to, sorry if I keep bringing it up, okay. but your, your image of the acorn, I'm, I'm wondering then if you're focused more on the soil that the acorn is planted into 
right? Yeah. So we know the acorn is good because mm-hmm. we've seen trees grow from it before. Mm-hmm. That's this image is planted with you. It's grown. You're trying to pass it on now. Um, I, I, and I don't know if you want to in there or say anything about that, but um, there has to be a way to cultivate a soil that is ready to receive um, these seeds, mm-hmm. right? And then have them grow in them. The hope is, yes, for sure. And I think that's definitely part of of teaching and sort of bringing up a child. The other question that I think a lot about is, are there such things as poems that will grow that are bad, are wicked, and that grow into terrible things? Or are they just, you give them, the, are, are, or are they just, they're bad because they are not in relationship with truth and therefore they're not even going to grow in the heart? Or even... Uh, poorly rendered yeah that's yeah. yes exactly right. yes like Those you things... can be in touch with truth and say it poorly mm-hmm. yeah but doesn't the existence of like top 40 music prove that like bad seeds plant like i don't mm. know uh, i would i mean you could liken them to weeds they grow fast and they spread quickly but they're I'm speaking in generalities i'm sure there are great top 40 songs but right isn't that the I, i'm thinking specifically of like instagram poetry oh, right sure, same it's thing. Sure. all over and people get a short thrill from feeling validated or feeling like they're connected to some something deep sure. but they're not, they're not going to last. In a thousand years, people yeah. won't be reading that nonsense. <laughs> yeah, there is right. something that I find a little disturbing that if I walked into an old, fo- if I walked into like a retirement community in Florida and everyone was sort of sitting there who are quite elderly and I started saying, wouldn't it be nice if we were older and everybody would be able to sing that song with us, that there's something about like that the Beach Boys from the 50s and 60s have have uh, gone into their, um, you know, are, are so deeply embedded in their hearts that that's the thing they're able to that quote. They could be able to rem- remember those lyrics. Yes. Um, so yeah, maybe there is, maybe there, I don't like thinking that there is a danger of the things that we consume. I just sort of hope that they are infertile and they don't grow, but you're, you're contesting that they would grow, that Why these, don't... that there are things that can grow into the heart. Sure. Uh, and Think of, yeah, what are the things that I, I remember from my childhood? It's um, jingles and it's like mm-hmm. theme songs to TV shows I watched a lot. Like, and advertisements. Yes, and... but that's my point around soil, right? There, um, I, I, the soil has to be used to be healthy. And so what's the thing that I've been planting there for 30 years? Has that prepared me to receive Auden well or mm-hmm. has it not? And again, I, I think you can talk about that in non-religious terms. You can. Do you want to be the type of person who can receive the best of civilization mm-hmm. culture mm-hmm. art whatever or not mm-hmm. right so I, again i think there are ways to your question earlier of how do you talk to people about consuming art i think that's a way to talk about that mm-hmm. right do you want to experience human excellence or do you want to be tied to pop culture and whatever's popular yeah similar to going on on a, on a journey of being able to like food mm-hmm. you know what a burger versus going to a very nice restaurant and sure. having something produced by someone with a vision, sure. a genius. No, yeah. I'm now, now we're getting into the, the other way of interpreting it. Does somebody who cooks food is, is inspired by the muses? Um, anyway, there, my point, sort of the thesis, if we wanted to give a thesis yes. statement to this, is that I think a lot of people think that the classical way of thinking about art is stuffy and elitist, and the romantic way is democratized, and spread out. And I think it's absolutely the opposite. opposite. I think that saying that a clerk at a bank can be in touch with the muses and can write poetry about true things as much as some, as a Hemingway who's lived this crazy life. But, and then the romantic one is the one that sequesters art off to the elites. Somebody who's gone off and done some, uh, some fringe life. Yeah. And even you're talking about the creation of art, but also the consumption of it. Yes. The, you know, uh, Marcus Aurelius's uh, meditations that's available to anyone mm-hmm. and would be eminently practical to you today, even though he was an emperor when he wrote it. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's interesting that the, the, this information isn't uh, compare that we've talked about PhDs in an in between episode before there's a type of um, approach to academia where you're only trying to speak to other PhDs, mm-hmm. right. As opposed to actually helping, uh, large groups of people. Yeah. That's the distinction you're talking about, right? Yeah. Um, final thought on this is that we, as people who sort of live common mundane lives, no, I don't want to say mundane, as common lives, mm-hmm. as non-special lives, so we're still alive, line from uh, um, 
Gibbs's podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, but we still experience like so. You are a father. Mm-hmm. You're doing something that like the vast majority of history of men in history have done sure. is like experiencing as raising a boy. Sure. Um, what is there's nothing more common than that. Right. But your experience of it is, I'm sure, a, uh, uh, enormously elevated and emotionally charged thing oh, because it's happening to, to me. You yes. are experiencing as opposed it. to reading a story about um, um, Odysseus raising is it Telemachus? Yeah, or, or yeah we can yeah. even yeah. use me. I don't have a, I don't have a child. I, sure. I'm not a parent. So my theory of it, my, my experience of it, is only theoretical. Right. Your experience of it is 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 by having lived it if you were to write a if you were just in your in your commonality and you know mm. i don't mean that as an insult mm. in your common life if you were to express um if you you were to think about what is true about being a father and were to write that in a poem uh because you spelt, felt inspired to do it that is more of the like if you just said i really want i, I just there's some something in me that wants to produce the poem right. talking about how, what raising I a child. about raising a child. Yeah. There is more. That is a a, a more humane thing of, uh, uh, and and that poem would be more would be in, in sort of touch with this the truism of the universe than somebody who has experience of, of fatherhood was obscure or fringe. Or uh, totally on the the margins of theoretical, right? The, having not actually raised either a not child. having uh, having raised a child, or whose experience of fatherhood was completely, um, uh, like not normative. Doesn't that contradict the point that art is coming from muses as opposed? To, so, from what you're saying, that would be my individual genius, my individual experience. No, as because to, sir, what you you sitting there as a um someone who works in a high school who just decided one day that he was going to write a poem, mm. you were inspired. That's the muses hitting you. Interesting. Whereas somebody says, man, you live such a crazy life. You owe it to everybody to like write about it. Cause it's so crazy and fringe. And yeah, I guess the only, again, the only thing I'd want to be careful for is that experience is the thing that would justify the writing of that poem mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. the reception yeah. of that art because that goes back to biography then. Ah, yeah. So I could write a poem about being a father sure. and it'd be true, sure. even though I've never had a child. Sure. Yeah, and that's fair. Uh, yeah. Again, this is like a criticism people try to say about Paul, who in the Bible will write about married people, mm-hmm. even though he was never married. Mm-hmm. He still has, if he has wisdom, he's speaking wisdom. Good. And he's yes, tapping into good. something that's true, that's whether good. he experienced it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, same if, if you're a Catholic and your priests are, uh, are celibate and they still give marriage advice, that's still within their realm to do, right? Yep. It's not the experience that justifies it. Yeah. Anyway, that's the thought. And also, this poem is just... Just beautiful. Sure. Oh, the last, yeah, I didn't talk about this, and we still have two minutes. Um, the poem's in a form. What form it, is that? I mean, it, it rhymes. It rhymes and it's in a form. It's in four oh. lines uh, per stanza. A, B, B, A. C, D, D, C. Legs, eggs, pity, city. Yep. Fast, fast across moss. Now, um, this is also, so modern poetry, we want to have not be in forms. We want to invent the forms. We want it to come from our own individual genius. I've tried both experiments with my students. I said, today we're writing a poem and write whatever you want and in whatever form you want. And they're all bad. They're just, it's not good. Then I say, you're going to write a poem and you have to stick to this rigid form. Well, their first inclination is how dare you don't (laughs) and how dare you chain my genius. And it's like, no, trust me. I want to express myself. Yeah. When they stick to the rigid form, the poems are miles better. I believe it. Miles better. Yeah. Um, and there is something about um, conf- uh, about forcing yourself to conform to a pattern that is beautiful. Like even just listening to it is beautiful. Well, I mean, even just constraints. Most con- artists will tell you that self, even self-imposed c- constraints mm-hmm. help to create. Yes. Yes. Um, and... Uh, uh, and to bring it sort of back to Lewis, Lewis said that poems um, have a father and a mother. The father is the form, hmm. and the mother is the um, relationship of the artist to the muses, hmm. the, the inspiration. Oh, yeah. you almost had such good alliteration there. The father is the form, the mother is the muse? No, oh, yeah. So Missed opportunity. I'm not a poet, so that's <laughs> yeah. why. All right, well... This has been classical stuff. If I disappeared there for a moment, it's because I had favor delivering me pizza. And boys, I brought you un- onion rings. Oh, what a treat. What a day. Yeah. What a time what a for everybody. What a okay, man. so you guys can, you know, 
leave knowing that we are well taken care of, I guess. (laughs) And jealous of our onion rings. Yeah. So this has been Classical Stuff. As always, you can find us everywhere on Google, on the iTunes, on the YouTube. tweets at CLSS. Oh, they smell CAL so stuff. good. They smell so and good. And you can check out our website, classicalstuff.net. You can email us, the guys at classicalstuff.net. And you can patronize us. And we would appreciate your patronage. Yep. And I think that's it. It helps us buy onion rings. So sure. please, yeah, help. thanks. Yeah, all right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.